November 3, 1957. In the vast territory of the Soviet Union, some large antennas received the signal of an evolved biological life from space for the first time. The aliens, finally? No, they are emitted by the heart of a small dog which orbits the Earth every 104 minutes, moving up to 1,660 kilometers from the surface. A few hours later, that signal became increasingly weaker until it ceased completely and merged with the noise of the cosmic background. The memory of Laika, the first living being on Earth to travel in space, was now consigned forever to history, to the affection of millions of people. She was not the only one to be sacrificed in the name of many other innocent creatures that would have preceded and then followed. A mud of two years of age and six kilograms of weight, this is the first space traveler to depart from planet Earth. Her name was Kudravka, Little Curly, a name probably given to her by Russian researchers to whom she was entrusted after being captured while wandering around the outskirts of Moscow. But the newspapers around the world, uniformed and surprised, called her at the beginning in many ways, fondling her with nicknames such as Zuchka, Little Bug, or Limonchuk, Little Lemon, while the American newspapers always talked about her calling her Mutnik, a mixture of Mutt and Sputnik. Later, it became universally known simply as Laika, the term used by the Russians to define all dogs of Siberian derivation. Laika was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and transported into space aboard Sputnik 2, a satellite weighing 508 kilograms and 4 meters high that could offer its passenger a cramped space and life support for about one week. Sputnik 2 was fitted with some instruments for measuring solar radiation in the ultraviolet and X regions of the spectrum, and a metal sphere completely identical to Sputnik 1 containing a radio transmitter and the sealed chamber reserved for the dog. A special conical cover had to protect everything during the rocket's ascent before detaching once in orbit. Laika was in her pressurized and padded cabin, large enough to allow her to stretch her legs and perform some movement, although she was harnessed and carried a sack on her back to collect bodily waste. She fed herself with food and water administered in the form of jelly, while a video camera mounted in the cockpit roughly transmitted her low-resolution television image to the ground. Finally, some sensors monitored her heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. As the missile lifted under the thrust and roar of its engines, the little dog in the capsule began to whine painfully and fidget as she tried to escape, but the tight harness that wrapped her prevented any movement, except that of her head. Then, in the long minutes in which the missile's thrusters were forced to maximum, to overcome the force of gravity, it crushed her as in a vice and her heart rate reached the limit of infarction, going from the usual 100 to 250 beats every minute. The terror did not leave the dog even when it found itself, now weightless, in orbit around the Earth, between 216 kilometers of altitude. Only after three hours of that alienating condition did Laika calm down, unaware of the fate that awaited her. The Soviet Union, which only a month earlier had succeeded in launching the first artificial satellite into Earth's orbit, could again amaze the world by proving to be far ahead of the United States in the space race. Unfortunately, the Cold War policy had not given up time to design and build a landing system, and Sputnik 2 had no chance of making a soft return to Earth. Laika's sentence had been written even before its launch although the Russians only admitted later that the animal would not return to its native world. Indeed, they specified that Laika would be pitifully asleep and poisoned a little less than a week after launch, before the discharge of the batteries and the shutdown of all the equipment made life impossible on board. The dog, however, did not survive that long. A failure prevented the last stage of the carrier rocket from detaching from Sputnik 2, preventing the correct functioning of the air recirculation system. Also, part of the thermal insulation fell off, and the temperature inside the cabin soon reached 40 degrees Celsius. Officially, the Russians decreed that Laika's death occurred four days after launch due to the high temperature. However, it seems that the dog's biological signals ceased a few hours after takeoff. Lakita's story began shortly after the triumph of Sputnik 1, when then-Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev gathered leading Russian scientists and rocket technicians including Sergei Korolev, founder of the Soviet space program. Khrushchev harbored the desire to launch a new Sputnik, 
bigger, more sophisticated, and able to amaze the whole world once again, and he wanted it to be launched before November 7th of that same year, the 40th anniversary of the October Revolution. Korolev was working on a sophisticated satellite, what would become Sputnik 3 in May of 1958, but it would not be ready for launch before December of that year. Too late. On October 12, 1957, Khrushchev officially announced the decision to launch the second Sputnik, and to get to the appointment on time, Korolev and his team had to develop the new satellite in less than four weeks. The work on the new spacecraft was hectic, and the engineers and technicians had to go to the workshops and assembly shops to assist the workers in the construction of the components, as there was not even time to prepare detailed design drawings. There was no time to design a re-entry system, I said, and probably there was no time to equip the capsule with an efficient telemetry device. This would brilliantly explain why Sputnik 2 didn't get rid of the pitcher's last stage. It may not have been a failure that prevented its separation, but simply the need to use the telemetry system. Furthermore, the larger dimensions of the shuttle would have made it easily visible also from the point of view, simplifying the problem of determining its flight coordinates. Even in advance of its scheduled date, November 3, 1957, the Sapwood SS-68K-71 carrier, very similar to Sputnik 1's R-7 ICBM, broke away from the Baikonur soil, starting a new era, one in which living beings inhabit space. Six days later, Sputnik 2 ran out of all energy, and by now inert, continued to orbit the Earth until the natural decay of the orbit led it to disintegrate when re-entering the atmosphere. After having completed 2,570 orbits in 162 days, a trail of fire passed over New York and finally scattered Laika's ashes over the Amazon on April 14, 1958. Laika was the only animal ever sent into space, already knowing that it would never return. And still today, one wonders whether it was an indispensable experiment to open the way to space for man, or useless and cynical cruelty. In 1998, Oleg Gazenko, one of the leading scientists of the Soviet space program at the time, expressed his disappointment at the murderous choice in an interview in Moscow, stating, The more time passes, the more I regret that beast. We shouldn't have done that. We didn't learn enough from that mission to justify her death. In Star City outside Moscow, there is a monument to the Russian cosmonauts who died on a mission. Like us also remembered in a corner of the building, the statue of a small mongrel dog with upright ears commemorates her sacrifice. Laika was the first animal to fly around the Earth, but it was certainly not the only one to be launched. Many preceded it in suborbital flights since the late 1940s on both sides of the Iron Curtain. To inaugurate the series of missile experiments with animals on board, was the Macaque Albert, who on June 14, 1949, left the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico for a suborbital flight aboard a German V-2 captured by the Americans. To that of poor Albert, who died of suffocation during the flight, three other similar flights followed, with as many monkeys on board, Albert 2, 3, and 4. None of them survived. The choice of the United States fell mainly on monkeys and primates, while the Russians opted mostly on female dogs. Among the evolved animals, they were the most suitable to be trained and trained for the stress of the launch and adapted well enough to remain inactive for a long time. The female dogs then allowed themselves to be preferred for their docility and the ability to urinate without having to raise their paw. The monkeys were implanted with sensors to measure their vital signs and many were under anesthesia during the launch. The mortality rate among monkeys at this stage was very high. About two-thirds of all monkeys launched in the 1940s and 50s died on a mission or soon after returning. Laika was followed by a small rhesus macaque named Gordo, who flew on the Jupiter AM-13 on December 13, 1958, exceeding 1,000 kilometers of altitude. Gordo did not suffer from any physical problems during the flight, but unfortunately, his capsule was never found after landing in the Atlantic Ocean. On May 28, 1959, the first success, Abel, a 3.1 kilogram macaque, and Baker, a Seamurai monkey weighing just 310 grams, were launched aboard the Jupiter AM-18. In 16 minutes of flight, they covered 2,735 kilometers, reaching an altitude of 579 kilometers, 
at a speed of over 18,000 kilometers an hour. They experienced an acceleration of over 38 times the force of gravity and remained in weightlessness for about nine minutes. They were recovered alive and in good condition, thus becoming the first living beings to return from a space flight, albeit suborbital. Abel, however, died four days later due to anesthesia during a surgical operation to remove an electrode that had caused him an infection. Baker instead died of kidney failure on November 29, 1984, at the age of 27, and was buried on the grounds of the United States Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Two dogs named Otsvania and Stesnika, Courageous and Snowflake, accompanied by a rabbit named Marfusha, Martha, flew on July 2, 1959, aboard an R-2A rocket for a high-altitude test and were recovered unharmed. Aunt Svania flew four more times in similar tests. Another American male monkey, Sam, flew into space on December 4, 1959, and landed unscathed in the Atlantic Ocean, where he was recovered. He reunited with his partner, Miss Sam, under the eyes of his veterinarian, who claimed that their encounter was moving, almost human. And Miss Sam, on January 21, 1960, tested the emergency ejection system that would later be used in human flights. Once again, the couple could happily reconstitute themselves after the mission. Luck instead turned its back on Bars and Lisishka, Lynx and Little Fox, who perished on July 28, 1960, in the explosion of their Vostok immediately after takeoff. Belka and Strelka, Squirrel and Arrow, flew on August 19, 1960 on Sputnik 5, completing 18 orbits. Forty mice and two rats also took part in the mission. A few months after her flight, Strelka gave birth to six beautiful puppies, one of which, Pushinka, was given to JFK Jr. Chalka and Mushka, Scarabeo and Mosca passed into space on December 1, 1960, aboard Sputnik 6, but the wrong return trajectory caused the capsule to be destroyed and the two dogs lost. Damka and Krasovka, Queen and Beauty, attempted an orbital flight on December 22, 1960, but the last stage of their rocket failed and the launch aborted. However, both dogs were recovered safe and sound. Ham, a chimpanzee flying on January 31, 1961, aboard Mercury Redstone 2, paved the way for the flight of Alan Shepard, the first American in space, with a suborbital flight. Just as Chernushka, Black, on March 9, 1961, marked the way to Yuri Gergarin by flying in Sputnik 9 together with mice and guinea pigs, were watching over the mannequin of a fake cosmonaut. Even Vazdishka, Starlet, whose name was chosen by Gagarin, successfully made an orbit in space aboard Sputnik 10 on March 25, 1961. It was the last test before the flight of the Vostok, piloted by the first cosmonaut. Enos, a chimpanzee, flew on the Mercury Atlas V on November 19, 1961, but it was supposed to have completed three orbits before returning to Earth but a failure forced the landing after the second orbit. After recovering, the Quadromini jumped out of his capsule and ran for a long time on the deck of the rescue ship, beating five on the hands of all the crew members he met, showing how happy he was. However, the fate of two other American chimps, Goliath and Scatback, is unfortunate. Goliath's atlas exploded just after takeoff, while Scatback's capsule was lost forever at sea upon returning. These failures did not, however, preclude John Glenn from becoming the first American to make an Earth orbit. Veritok and Ugaluk, Breeze and Ember remained in orbit for the record time of 23 days, from February 22nd to March 16, 1966, aboard the Cosmos 110. They were both recovered safe and sound and still hold the record of the permanence of animals in space. Special mention for the Soviet mission Zond-5, which launched on September 14, 1968, brought turtles, flies, worms, and bacteria to circumnavigate the moon four days later. They were the first living beings to see the hidden face of our satellite. On September 21st, the capsule landed in the Indian Ocean, and the turtles were visibly thinner, having lost about 10% of their body weight, but they were fine. These are certainly the best known and most celebrated names of the animals that died in space. But the complete list would be very long and compiling it would be very difficult. Before Laika, for example, starting from 1951, there were 18 suborbital launches on the Soviet side where 22 dogs were used, 8 of which were killed. 
After Laika, there were another 12 suborbital flights, with 15 dogs employed, two of which never returned home, followed by seven orbital flights in which 12 dogs participated, of which two died. And then there was Philisette, the cat from France, and plenty of mice, spiders, turtles, and gnats. We want to bring them all together in a big hug, because it's not true as we hear in the usual rhetorical speeches that they have offered their lives for us. It is true, on the other hand, that we took those lives from them by force. Nowadays, fortunately, no space agency, apart from some still belonging to the third world, would dare to use animals for their public experiments, even if unfortunately, but almost secretly, they do not hesitate to use the vivisection on the International Space Station or in laboratories on Earth. Laika, however, is not only the symbol of animal innocence betrayed, but it is also the bittersweet one of an era in which trying the impossible was normal. Let us realize that the Sputniks are chronologically closer to the Wright brothers' first airplane, which took off at Kitty Hawk 54 years earlier than they are today. Laika's flight was the first real test of the possibility of the human species to cross space. Sixty years later, having lost our youthful zeal, we have not yet taken all the possibilities that that sacrifice opened up for us.